Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. We are going to do a good old fashioned voiceover Q&A while you all watch me paint. Uh, this piece that I'm working on is one of the example demo pieces for my new Skillshare class. Uh, it's not specifically about painting birds, although I do paint two different kinds of birds in the class. The class is all about mixed media and it's a really just in-depth overview into my mixed media philosophy and how I use mixed media as a professional. Uh, I will leave a link to that Skillshare class in the description box. Uh, but while I am working on it today, I'm just going to answer some questions that you all sent in on Instagram. I'm going to try to get to all of them. We'll see. I think there's like nine or 10. Um, all right. So the first question is how to decide if LLC is a good choice for your art business. So this is actually one that I would be interested in knowing. Uh, I've talked to a couple of different lawyers about this and some seem to feel like an LLC would be a good move for me right now. And uh, other, well, one seems to think that. And then another that I've spoken to seems to think that it's not that big of a deal right now. So uh, I do not, I have not filed for an LLC yet. And it's something that I am thinking about doing. It's kind of on my radar screen for, for 2019 or maybe 2020, but I don't have a really good, clear answer to that yet. Uh, from what I understand, there are, it's a way to separate your business and some of the legal risks of your business from your personal assets. So that's about as much as I understand about it right now. And it wasn't something I thought about at all for the first couple of years, but as I've gotten more established, it is something I have considered more. So I guess that's the most answer I can give to that is that if you are just getting started and you're kind of still getting your feet wet, I personally wouldn't worry about it too much because I didn't worry about it too much when I was at that phase. But if you're like me and you're getting to a place where you're more established and this is definitely your career path and um, maybe like me, it's something that you want to consider a little bit more seriously. So uh, that is that question. Uh, next question. Hi, Kendall. What are your favorite brushes to use for watercolor and gouache? For watercolor, I really like watercolor brushes. Um, my Some of my favorites are um, the Neptune line by Princeton. I think they're all synthetic. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I, I think the whole Neptune line is synthetic. And I really like rounds, like smaller for smaller sizes so under under size four I tend to go for a round and if it's a bigger size then I really like quills um, occasionally I'll use a watercolor filbert but I, I've been really into rounds and quills lately and then for gouache I tend to actually prefer acrylic brushes I don't actually have a favorite brand for acrylic brushes I, I do like the ones that Liquitex makes but um, but I'm not necessarily you know a loyal user of those the way that I am of the um, Neptune brushes but uh, the reason I prefer acrylic for gouache is just because it does have at least the way I use it if I'm going to use gouache I, I use it at a full strength so I don't water it down to the level of watercolor where it's just you know super super thin and translucent uh, when I'm using gouache the texture is very similar to the texture Texture of acrylic, so I just prefer to use acrylic brushes. All right, next question. What's your hidden non-art talent? Okay, so <laughs> I was trying to think about this. I think I can't remember if I've mentioned this in a video or not before, but I always joke with family and friends that my um, my one prodigious skill is that I can understand and memorize song lyrics. I don't know why that is. I was never good at memorizing anything in school, but if it's a song, I just have to hear it like a couple of times to memorize it. And sometimes I'll start singing along to something in the car and Eric will be like, how do you already know the words to that? Or how can you even understand what they're saying? Uh, I don't know why, but... Uh, uh, but that is something that I can do. Sadly, I do not have a good singing voice, so I've never been able to put it to much use. All right, next question. Uh, what, according to your opinion, are some of the better ways of selling one's art pieces, product type, etc.? So I, I think what this person is asking is like what, um, whether to do like prints or stickers or fabric. <sighs> <laughs> and I honestly don't, I don't have like a really clear answer on this. I, I think I'll, I'll just speak about it from, from my own experience. And my own experience is that some of the easiest things to do are prints just because you need a decent printer and you need good paper. Um, and actually you don't even really need that. You can have somebody else do it. And the margin for entry there is pretty low too. If you find a good local printer, I mean, I wouldn't recommend anything like, you know, Kinko's or anything. You have to go to an actual uh, print shop, something, a place that specializes in making prints. But yeah, the barrier to entry for prints is pretty low uh, as opposed 
goes to things like stickers. Stickers are great because they have, uh, they're inexpensive and people, they're inexpensive for people to buy, but you really do have to invest quite a lot up front if you want them to, if you want to be able to get them at a good enough um, wholesale rate to, to make money selling them. With prints, uh, at least in, in my experience, I've, you, you can find, if you're not printing them yourself, you can usually find a printer who will, who will only do a few, who will do a run of just like a couple or a few prints for you. Whereas with stickers, in order to, uh, uh, to have a base and to get them at a good rate, you have to be buying like a couple hundred at a time. So even though stickers are cheaper for the customer than prints, I feel like they have a steeper barrier for entry because you have to be willing to invest several hundred dollars. And then I think it's the same with anything else too. You know, I've never had uh, like mugs or merchandise or anything made ahead of time. I've just used print on demand services like Redbubble uh, because I don't, I don't then have to invest that money up front. Um, and people do buy stuff off of there. I, I find that on Redbubble, the best sellers are the phone cases and the, um, I think they call them art pouches. They're just like little zippered pouches. And I, I've i never really given it a serious go with clothing. I, I've licensed my work to people who put it on fabric that goes on clothing, but I've never had clothing made myself. And uh, I've just started on Spoonflower like a couple of months ago and uh, have had some sales on there, but it hasn't been anything crazy. And I really haven't put much effort into it. So um, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I would say if you're just getting started, then maybe start out with art prints and, uh, see how that goes and then potentially look into something like stickers. And if you're feeling like you want to, um, invest a lot up front, uh, for potentially being able to sell more down the road. I know a lot of artists really like doing, uh, tea towels, uh, little dish towels, but, um, but you have to be able to buy quite a large quantity, uh, up front to, to do that. So, um, or of course, look into print on demand sites like Redbubble or um, Society6, whatever else. Uh, next question, what are your favorite watercolor paint brands? So uh, if you watch my channel, you're probably sick of me talking about this brand, but I have been obsessed with uh, the Dr. P.H. Martin's Hydrus watercolors ever since I got them for Christmas last year. Uh, I have seen, there's one artist, um, I, I always forget how she pronounces her name. I think it's San, Sanja Art. I think that's what her channel name is. And uh, I saw that painter using them and she has a pretty different style than me. Um, and then I had also seen like some lettering artists using them, but I, so I, they just look kind of fun to me and I thought I wanted to try them. So I had them on my wish list last year and um, a family member bought them for me, but I totally underestimated how awesome they were and how integral they would become to my process. Uh, and that the main thing that I love about them is that they are um, not reactivated at all uh, once they're dry. So you can, they, they look the same as watercolor, like really opaque, excuse me, really translucent and um, luminescent and really beautiful. But you can lay down even a pretty heavy layer of like something really dark, a dark color. Like sometimes I'll put in the details in something, the really dark details, like in a dark brown, and then go over the top of that with a, a light wash of color afterwards. And the brown doesn't reactivate. The Whatever you've laid down initially doesn't reactivate. So that just makes it I find with the way that I work, that makes it really easy to, you know, have my sketch and then kind of mark out where the details are uh, and then do the big washes of color so that I don't obscure any of my sketch. So uh, that's probably my favorite watercolor brand at the moment. I, I have some Daniel Smith watercolors and they're really beautiful, but um, I just find that I'm always reaching for the, the hydrous ones. Um, and definitely over my, I have my little Schmincke uh, travel set, which I, I like for travel. But um, yeah, if I'm in the studio, I pretty much always reach for the hydrous watercolors. Where do you get your photo references from? Uh, so I have talked about this some before, um, and I actually just did a video about reference photos uh, last week. But for the most part, I get my reference photos by taking them myself. Uh, that's always my first choice because you can control everything about the image that way. Or occasionally family and friends will send me photos. Sometimes you guys send me photos on Instagram. And if I don't get anything that way or if I can't get a... Oh, and also, of course, quite often clients uh, give me the photos. So a lot of the time they already 
have the reference image, they know what they want me to draw. So yeah, th those are some primary ways. And then if I'm in a situation where I have to source a photo myself and it's something that I can't go take myself, like say I need, you know, I don't know, coffee cherries or um, a photo of a sloth or, or <laughs> something that I'm not going to be able to like run out to the grocery store or, you know, go out for a walk and take the photo myself. Um, I will go to um, image banks that are that have images in the public domain, so like Wikimedia, uh, Morg File, Pixabay, Pixabay. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but um, those are all places that you can get uh, photos that are free for use that have no copyright restrictions, uh, and those are pretty much the only ones that I will use in terms of getting photos online that I didn't take, just because they're uh, the only ones that are really safe to use, which I also have talked about in a uh, video before and I will try to link that on the screen and in the description. All right, next question. Can I use wax and oil-based colored pencil together? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I have done that at times and it works totally fine. Uh, there really isn't any restriction on that from <laughs> from my perspective. I think they, they work really well together, um, wax and oil, um, and you can layer them on top of each other, use them at the same time. Uh, yeah, no problem there. All right, last question. What is your favorite tool that has helped you stay organized and productive as a freelance artist? So this is a recent favorite as well. Um, about a year ago, no, not quite a year ago. I think it was it was earlier in 2018. I started using Bonsai um, as a platform to help me manage um, everything from proposals and quotes. So like when I send out an estimate for work to, uh, contracts to invoices. And before I would generate those documents myself, like I would have a word document and then I would export a PDF and send it to the client and they'd sign it and send it back to me. And I would have all of those. I would try to have all of those archived on my computer. Uh, but it was getting to be a real pain to keep track of all of them. And then also just, um, you know, a lot of the time I'll send out a proposal and not all the proposals I send out get accepted. And so I felt like I was kind of drowning and trying to keep track of like accepted proposals or rejected proposals and signed contracts and what invoices had been paid and what invoices hadn't. And uh, it just was becoming, uh, the larger my business grew, the, the more of a burden it was becoming to keep track of that sort of thing. So uh, earlier this year, I started using Bonsai uh, to do all of that. And uh, I was a little bit unsure when I signed up for it because at that point, I think it was one of the first paid services I, I did. And uh, at this point, I just cannot imagine, <laughs> I cannot imagine working without it. It is so helpful. It's helped me stay on top of uh, making sure I get paid. Uh, it sends the reminders to clients for me. So I still have had to go out and like make a few calls and send a few reminders myself manually. But for the most part, it does all of that. And uh, I mean, you of course have to still make the invoices and you have to you know, make the contracts and all of that, but you can use templates. You can just, what I've done is I've just pulled the uh, recommended contracts right out of the back of the gag guide, the graphic artist guild, uh, handbook for pricing and ethical guidelines, that book that I talk about all the time. Uh, I just used an OCR reader, uh, to, I scanned a picture of the contract at the back of the book and used an OCR, uh, converter online to, uh, change the image to editable text and then I just dropped that right into the contract template on Bonsai so I've got a gag approved contract and uh, and then it, it links up all of your all of your projects and all of your contracts and all of your invoices so say if you're doing something for client a uh, client all of the proposals that you've done for client a will be with client a and so will all of the invoices it it just makes it so much easier and you can duplicate invoices you can duplicate contracts uh, i'm obsessed with it i love it i wish i had done it sooner oh you can track expenses on it as well um, and i think you can even use it for time tracking i don't i don't use it for time tracking because i primarily just do um, flat fee pricing um, but yeah, I would say aside from the very simple thing of just like having a to-do list, my, um, my most helpful organization and, and productivity tool for sure is Bonsai. So, um, I have said, I've, I've mentioned before the possibility of doing a video on that and, uh, it sounded like there was some interest. So I, I can still, I could put that on my list to do. If you guys are still interested in seeing a video on Bonsai, let me know. 
Uh, all right, so I think that is going to be it for this week's video. A uh, big thank you, of course, as always, to my patrons who are supporting this channel and making it possible for me to make videos. And thank you to all of you for watching. Um, as usual, please let me know in the comments if you have any questions or thoughts or um, yeah, other questions that you want me to do in a future Q&A, what you think about the idea of a bonsai video, uh, all of that. And uh, thank you to Meg for editing. And I hope everybody has a great week and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Mm -hmm.